Hi there, and welcome to another episode of View from the Other Side. Thank you for joining me. Today, I wanted to talk about the soul's journey. So first of all, um, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between soul and spirit? People use it interchangeably. Um, usually, no matter whether I hear a pe person say soul or spirit, I kind of just use my mind to discern what they mean. Um, what I found with me, the way I use soul and spirit, is that when I'm referring to a person, like usually a living person, I refer to the light inside of them as their soul. So in other words, I often use the word soul when the person is still alive. And then, so in fact, with myself, I talk about my soul's journey your soul's journey, deep in your soul, what you feel. So it is your spirit, but it is the spirit um, while it is living in the body, and I call that a soul. I tend to use the word spirit when it's disembodied, when I'm speaking about the, specifically about the other side. I say, oh, I got a message from spirit. So I'm talking about a disembodied soul, but because they're not in a body, I tend to call them spirit. I don't know where I got this distinction from, but it just seems to be how I use these two words. So I just wanted to start by explaining that. Um, so I wanted to talk about the soul's journey, but we can also call it the spirit's journey. But really it is, I'm speaking about the journey of them coming into life and going back into death. So it is the journey of the soul. I believe that not all spirits um, incarnate or many spirits may be incarnated many many years ago centuries ago uh, millennia ago and maybe have chosen not to incarnate anymore and just stay on that side and just help us but um, souls are basically what's exp being expressed through you and me right now what well, uh, we have souls so um, so I wanted to start by speaking about my view from when I was on the other side, one of the things I realized is that my soul had been on this journey. And many of you who know my story, you know that I had cancer. I had lymphoma for four years and I was on my deathbed and um, my organs had shut down and I had tumors the, many of them the size of golf balls from the base of my skull all around my neck, in my chest, under my arms, all the way down to my abdomen. The cancer had metastasized um, and I weighed 85 pounds. My body had stopped ad absorbing nutrition. Um, my muscles had completely deteriorated and so I couldn't walk and so I was just lying there and at that point, after four years of going through cancer, that's when I reached that point, my organs shut down um, and I'd gone into a coma and the doctors told my family that I was not going to come out of the coma. And that's when my soul left my body and crossed over and my soul felt incredible, like absolutely incredible. It felt light and it, was, it felt free. When my soul was expressing itself through my physical body, I had felt a tremendous amount of fear. Fear of the disease, fear of the treatments, fear of death, just fear of everything. But now that I had left my body, my soul felt incredible. It felt loved, like unconditionally or divinely loved, like it was bathed in a sea of love. It just felt so amazing. It was the first time that I recall ever feeling that level of love. I had probably felt that level of love before I came into life, but I had not felt that level of lo love in my physical life. Um, but one of the things that I felt, which I recall that I want to share with you, is that I felt as if I had been on this arduous journey and that now I had come home. It was like my soul had come home and I was surrounded by other beings, some of whom I recognized, but not all. I, I recognized my dad, my best friend who had crossed over, and there were others who I didn't recognize. But they were all there to greet me. They were there to welcome me home. 
And it was like such a beautiful and loving and warm welcome. Nobody judged me. And even the souls, like my dad had hurt me really badly when I was, when he was alive. Um, all I felt even from him was pure, unconditional love. Something happens when we shed our bodies, where we realize the hurt that we've caused other people. And I realized that my dad had been helping me all these years, like through my disease. And I didn't even know that my dad really loved me until I crossed over. And I realized, oh my gosh, he really does love me. He just, his life was, um, his cultural upbringing and his physical self was so restrained and so sometimes very cold. And yet here on the other side, he wanted me to know that he didn't know better when he was in the physical. He didn't know better and he wanted me to know that he actually loved me unconditionally and had been watching over me um, since he had crossed over and he'd been watching over my whole family. He was not a warm and loving kind of person when I knew him in physical life. So when we cross over, we really do leave behind all that baggage that even the baggage that causes us to even be awful people, like awful or abusive, not saying that my dad was that awful, but, but even if you have someone in your life who is awful and abusive, it's like when you cross over or when they cross over, they realize what they've done and they're like, oh my gosh, I really screwed up that person's life. And they do it not because they're out to get you. My dad did not set out to hurt me. It was more like he was so messed up that he messed up other people's lives. And that's what they realized. They're like, wow, my life was so screwed up that I ended up screwing up all these other people's lives. And then what they feel is they want to go out of their way to help these other people who they've hurt. And so they, interestingly, the ones who've hurt you, can actually become your greatest allies and supporters and guardian angels from the other side, even if you don't realize it, even if you're not willing to accept it, because it's hard for us to accept it. We reject the notion that someone who hurt us in physical life could be our guardian angel because our minds are like, oh, we can repel them. But you don't need to accept it. They're still there in the background making sure they're taking care of you. Um, that's what I felt when I crossed over. That was the direct imprint that I got from my dad and from other souls who were there. Um, one of the things that happened, if I fast forward a little bit, is that um, when I came out of the coma, and I remember a couple of days after coming out of the coma, after the near-death experience, and I was still lying in bed recovering. It was literally a couple of days after coming out, and I was recovering. But I was elated at being given this second chance of life because now I wasn't dying anymore. I knew I was going to be fine because I was given the choice of whether to come back or go or continue. And my dad said to me, I have these gifts waiting for me. And so I came back. And, and so a couple of days after that, a nurse came in and said, you need to move around. You need to exercise. You need to kind of move your legs a bit. So she helped me get out of bed and to kind of walk around the room a little bit. So I was holding her arm with one hand and holding the IV stand with the other hand. And we were kind of walking around the room. And I said to her, can I just go to the bathroom and look in the mirror? I haven't seen myself. I haven't seen how I looked in ages. Now, I had been feeling euphoric after coming out of the near-death experience. Um, but when I looked in the mirror, I actually got a shock because I didn't look anything like how I thought I looked. Um, it, what I thought in my head was that I was already looking well. But the physical body sometimes, you know, with denser energy, needs time to catch up. But when I looked in the mirror, what I saw was someone who was completely emaciated. Um, my cheeks were completely sunken in. I literally looked like a skull. Um, my he head was bald, I had no hair, cheeks were sunken in, and I had this big bandage around my neck because I had, 
these open skin lesions. And, and when I looked in the mirror, and as I told you, I weighed about 85 pounds, um, I looked at myself and I actually started crying. Because what I saw, remember I just came out of a near-death experience, I wasn't crying out of vanity for how I looked, but what I saw was that I had put my own soul through quite a journey. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I made this promise to myself and I said, and I actually said to myself that, wow, I did this to you. And when I say I did it, I'm not saying it's your fault if you get sick. But I realized the reason I had got sick, I realized this in the near-death experience, the reason I got sick was because I had never loved myself. I had always thrown myself under the bus, judged myself, criticized myself, put myself last. I had been a doormat to everyone. I thought everyone else was more important than me. Everyone else's problems were more important than mine. Um, even when I was sick, I didn't prioritize my illness. I worried more about um, troubling other people. So I hid the fact that I was sick. Even as the cancer got worse, I pretended I was fine because I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't want to be a problem. So I put myself through treating myself like a doormat and not honoring myself and suppressing myself and suppressing my soul. And now here I was on the other side of the near-death experience looking at myself in the mirror and I really saw my soul as I looked in my eyes and I, and I cr was crying and I said, I will never forsake you again. I will never put you through that again. I will always love you and value you. And that was me talking to my soul, not just my physical body, because the soul is the greater part of who you are. And so I invite you all to do that. Talk to your soul like that every day, because your soul is the main part of who you are. Your physical body is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just a small fraction of yourself. So every morning, give yourself a hug and say, I will never forsake you. I will not be so harsh on you or be cruel to you. And that is what I mean when I talk about self-love. It's loving the soul because from that vantage point, from that vantage point of having just come out of the near-death experience, I could see how I had done it to myself. I could see it was not some God punishing me or spirit punishing me. It was not like some kind of bad karma I had. It was me not honoring myself, my soul. And here's why it's really important to honor your soul. Your soul is a part of the divine. It's a piece of God or a piece of the divine. Your soul chose to come and express itself through this body at this point in time. And if you deny that, if you don't love yourself, if you keep criticizing yourself and judging yourself, and, um, and throwing yourself under the bus and doormatting yourself, what you are doing is you are denying a piece of God, the divine, from expressing itself through you. And you don't have the right to deny the divine from expressing itself through you. And so the soul has chosen this journey. And I just feel so blessed that I was given this second chance but I truly believe that had I known then what I know today, I wouldn't have had to suffer so much, which is why I keep sharing my story in so many different ways. I want people to truly know what it means to value your soul and your soul's journey and to love yourself. It's, it's not just about loving your physical body. It really is about honoring the journey that your soul has been through you're, you know, whatever you've been through, if you've been through abuse or whatever you've been through, if you've been through hardship or poverty or relationship issues, you are here, standing here right now, and your soul has been through all of that with you. And you always have the choice to make different choices moving forward. So honor your soul. And the more that you love your soul, the more likely you are 
to make loving choices for yourself. So what changed for me and my soul's journey on the day of that near-death experience was that I chose to make more loving choices for the trajectory of my soul, for the journey of my soul. Up until the point that I died, I made every choice from a place of fear. And what does it mean to make every choice from a place of fear? It means I feared not being good enough. I feared the disapproval of other people. I feared getting sick. I feared cancer. Everything I did came from a place of avoiding other people's disapproval, um, avoiding getting cancer. I ate all the right foods and did all the right things, but not because I loved my soul and loved my life. I did it because I was afraid of getting sick. I was afraid of getting cancer. When we live that way, what we're doing, the message you are sending to your soul when you live that way is you're sending the message that my body is weak. Um, my, I, have to, I have to intervene all the time. In actuality, we need to live the other way, the, what I call the inside out way instead of the outside in. So what is the inside out way? The inside out way means allowing your soul to take the lead in your life, allowing your soul to express itself through you, knowing that your soul is eternal. It's super powerful. It's connected to all the wisdom of the other side. It has access to information that you cannot have access to in the physical. You have access to the internet. Your soul has access to the esoteric net. And that is infinite. It has access to the infinite net. And so you want your soul to give you information. What I was doing, and we all make the mistake of doing this, what I was doing is I was getting my information from the physical world, from other people, and all this information was fear-based information that, oh, one in three people are going to get cancer by the year, whatever, 2015 or whatever. Um, right now we hear it all the time as well on the news. Like, and what that information does when we're feeling all the time like you might get cancer and then you're watching other people get cancer, what it does is that it makes us feel like victims of our circumstances. It makes us feel that we can get sick at any time and our bodies are actually um, not strong in our soul. It makes, it doesn't, it doesn't empower, it disempowers you. And you feel, I have to go do the research to figure out how to prevent cancer. But what you do when you do that is you're giving your power away to the outer world. The outer world is what I call our cultural field. You're giving your power away. But when you are connected to your higher self, to the esoteric field, and the way to connect is to say, I am going to allow my soul to express itself through me instead of telling my soul or telling myself what I need to do. So when we allow our souls to express itself through us, that's when magic and miracles can start to happen. The, the soul chooses to come and express itself through you so that it can actually guide you. The soul has access to other spirits and other spiritual beings. Um, the soul, as I said, is connected to the infinite net. And sometimes I use this analogy to kind of um, express it a little better. So I'm going to leave you with this analogy. And um, do you remember those mirror balls, those disco balls from back in the 70s, like the days of Saturday Night Fever and all that. So there were these disco balls, like, and so it was a ball of all these mirror tiles. So when you think of that, when you, go in, when you went into a disco, um, you had, and I used to go to those in my younger days, and, uh, and so when you go into one of those, what you see is you see all these little specks of light on the wall of the room that you're in, the room with the disco ball. And you see these specks of light spinning around, and they're all separate specks of light, individual specks of light. 
hundreds and hundreds of individual specks of light. And it's like they're chasing each other, going round and round the room. Now, if you just see those specks of light, you would, you would easily think, if you don't know where it's coming from, you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that they are all individual specks of light, completely separate from each other. But when you realize where it's coming from, it's coming from one giant mirror ball, that's when you realize, oh my gosh, it's coming from one thing. But it's casting light, separate lights. And so this one mirror ball is, is made up of all these mirror tiles. Now imagine if we think of it this way, each of these mirror tiles is somebody's soul. Each of them is somebody's soul or a spirit. But let's say somebody's soul. And each of them is casting a light on the wall, an individual light. That light is one of us expressing ourselves in the physical. So each of those tiles is expressing itself as a light on the wall. Each soul is expressing itself as one of us, as a physical body. We think we're separate. We compete with each other. We, um, some, some people among us in our world are ruthless and we feel we need to get ahead of other people. But when we die, we realize we're all part of the same mirror ball. We're all actually connected. If only the soul realized it while it was alive, it would actually handle life very differently. It would treat each other very differently. Um, but it's only when we die, we tend to realize that, um, it's only when we die do we tend to get that understanding that we are all connected as one mirror ball. And because we are all connected, if you can realize this while you're alive, then you will know that you are just a speck of light but your soul that is reflecting that light, your soul where your light that's shining through your eyes is coming from, your soul is connected to every other soul. And because it's connected to every other soul, it can access information from all the other souls. That's how we have ESP. That's how we can know what other people are thinking when we tune in. That's how we connect with other people because we are all connected at that level. When we live knowing that we're connected, we become so powerful. When we live as though we are just that light on the wall and, have, and don't even realize that there's a soul that's a mirror ball that's reflecting on us, that's when we compete with everyone else. That is what living in fear. So I always tell people the difference between living in love and living in fear is that living in fear is believing that you are just a random speck of light, not connected to anyone or anything, just an accident that's floating around, and, and you are a victim of anything that might come along, and you have to constantly run around and protect yourself and do stuff to take care of yourself. That's what it is to be disconnected from your soul and from the mirror ball or the divine. Let's call the mirror ball the divine. Or are you someone who realizes that, oh, that light that shines through my eyes is actually one of the mirrors on the divine mirror ball, and I am connected to the whole, and I will let that light live through me because that light has access to all the information, including my divine purpose. That light will connect me, that soul, because it's connected to everyone, it will connect me with the right people at the right time when I most need it, as long as I allow it, as long as I allow it. And when you live from that place, when you live in that space of love and trust, then what happens is the light finds it easier, the soul, your soul finds it easier to communicate and live through you. When you live in that space of fear, of that defensiveness that I got to do this, I'm, and you live in that state of anxiety and fear and victimhood, it's much harder to access.
that state of divine. So I wanted to leave you with that, and we will go deeper into this and many other subjects in the coming weeks. And thank you so much for tuning into this. Um, and just remember, live from the state of love instead of fear. It's much healthier, it's much more powerful, and you will get divine messages and divine connections. And that's what it means to live from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. When you live from the inside out, you create your, your own reality from your soul's purpose. When you live from the outside in, you react to a reality that other people have created. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you all next week or around social media. Bye. Oh.